So my job today is, my name is, by the way, I guess I should say that, is Beth Oprish. I work for the Pretrial Justice Institute as the National JDAI uh, Training Manager, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. Today is the first part. We have another session scheduled for March 13th. We'll talk more about that afterwards, but you'll see on the bottom of your screen, you'll see where there is, where you can click to register for part two. Also, on the left part of your screen at the bottom, you're going to see a chat box. So if you have a problem, technology-wise, we have someone behind the scenes, Tracy, who will take care of all of those issues. And again, a shout out to Tracy for her help in making this come together. So my job is to moderate, not to talk. So my biggest task will be to keep us on time. We have a lot of information to cover over the next hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started with a conversation about confinement and the purpose of detention. This is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the dangers of detention, adolescent brain development, the purpose of detention, and the cost of detention. So having set up what we're going to, call, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to turn it over. Now, I'm just going to let each speaker introduce themselves. So um, I'm going to turn it over to our first group of speakers, which is David, Monica, and Michelle. Again, as they start talking, they will introduce themselves and talk about, in this section, the dangers of detention. David? Um, why don't I turn it over to Nebraska to do their portion first, and then I'll, I'll cover the Arizona purpose of detention statement next. Hey, perfect. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Michelle Luters, and I work with the Administrative Office of Probation and I focus on the juvenile intake and detention alternatives piece for our system. I help our probation staff across the state with the utilization of the risk assessment tool that is used at the point of intake um, here in Nebraska. And in Nebraska, we have um, statutorily outlined what our definition or our purpose of detention is, which helps guide our probation officers in the decisions they make as it relates to why young people end up in a detention facility. And in Nebraska, we um, have three points that we focus on or we look at, um, at at that point of detention. One is the risk to flee the court's jurisdiction, the risk to reoffend or community safety reasons for that young person in the community, and risk to self. The work that's done in Nebraska is helped facilitated by a subcommittee group that is a statewide collaboration from probation staff across the state, which uses the statute and the risk assessment tool to ensure the philosophy of the purpose of detention is in, ingrained through all of our training practices that goes through our new probation officer training, as well as seasoned or current probation staff as refresher trainings to ensure we are all um, practicing the same way the purpose of detention. Thank you. Um, so in, in Arizona, the, our court rules allow for the detaining of youth for one of the following five reasons. The juvenile will not otherwise be present at a hearing. The juvenile is likely to commit an offense injurious to self or others. The juvenile must be held for another jurisdiction or the interests of the juvenile or public require custodial protection or the juvenile must be held pending the filing of a complaint into the adult court. So um, that's what our rule of procedure dictates as a purpose of detention or when detention can be used. However, our JDAI State Advisory Committee, which is comprised of probation chiefs, law enforcement, child advocates, um, county prosecution, and public defender groups from around the state, came up with a purpose of detention you see on the screen. And that's our belief that youth can best be served within their community and should only be detained if they present a risk to the community or a risk of failing to appear at the next court hearing. We really would like to put those kind of eliminate detention um, as a kind of placeholder for mental health needs. We think that the kids would better be served by mental health professionals than detention officers. And um, so that's really how this purpose of detention evolved and kind of differs a little from our what we are legally allowed to do in the court rules. <clears throat> So um, if you think about detention, it's a traumatic disruption of the life events of the person experiencing it. Um, they're pulled from school and employment. Um, they are 
uh, and therefore should only be reserved for youth that we consider dangerous, um, not youth we're annoyed at. In addition to that, uh, <clears throat> it pulls kids deeper into the system and slows the natural aging out of delinquency. Alternatives are more effective at reducing recidivism at a fraction of the cost. Um, detention produces depression and tends to make mentally ill people worse. Uh, increases self-harm and suicidal ideation. Uh, youth with special needs often fail to return to school. Actually, uh, many youth, special needs or not, fail to return to school, as I said. Um, and this is especially tragic in rural counties um, in that there may be only one option for that kid to school to go in, and if they get expelled or labeled as being a youth that's been detained, teachers are often uh, quick to expel them or uh, have reasons to get them out of their classrooms, and then it might be a couple hundred miles to the next available school, and so that really severely impacts a youth's ability to get an education. Um, being detained impedes later success in the labor market. It's not very cost effective if these are in fact not dangerous kids, these are just kids we're mad at. And it has increasingly locked up youth of color at disproportional rates. And all this was found in this uh, seminal study that's illustrated on the slide there, the Juvenile Policy Institute's Dangers of Detention. <clears throat> Other studies have found that the harms of detention, so uh, kids who are kids who are show up to court from detention as opposed to from the community are 8.5 times more likely to be adjudicated. They're twice as likely to reoffend. 60% um, do not return to school or drop out within five months. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's really difficult to reintegrate into your community once you've been severed from it. They have less access to special education and services and fewer hours of instruction. And so who are these kids in our detention facilities? Well, this data on the slide here is from a national study released in August 2017 by the Ruderman Family Foundation. However, I'll also speak a little of Arizona's data. We know that in Arizona, a full 45 to 50 percent of the youth in detention are there for violations of probation rather than um, new offenses. <clears throat> Oftentimes, a consequence uh, is given as detention, and it would be more cost effective to limit those consequences uh, to community things and have the kid engage in uh, restitution that way as opposed to detention. As again, again, I stress, detention should only be reserved for those dangerous kids. But you can see here, 85% of the children in juvenile detention have at least one disability. Um, <clears throat> African American youth are more likely to go through school with untreated disabilities. Um, Children with no apparent disabilities, meaning those not immediately visible, such as learning disabilities, autism, mental illness, are often uh, undiagnosed and untreated and get criminalized for their behavior or at least expelled from schools for their behavior. Um, and then youth are more at risk of contact with the juvenile just justice system as a result of unmet mental health needs. And it's estimated between 60 and 80 percent of the incarcerated youth possess a mental health condition compared to 7 to 17 percent for the general population youth. Again, um, it's our belief that detention should be used not as a mental health hospital, but rather a, uh, a place for control if it, we in fact have a dangerous delinquent. Um, negative impacts. So I know I've hit on these before, but the research indicates that incarcerating young people leads to poor education and employment outcomes, disrupts positive support system, introduces young people to higher risk peers. Exposure to traumatic experiences like strip searches can re-traumatize young people. Um, and the trauma of simply having your liberty taken away um, should only be reserved again for those kids who absolutely need it. It tends to exacerbate mental illness, increase suicidal ideation. Um, youth recidivism rates within states are often reported at 50% higher for individuals who remain in secure facilities. Um, and further court records show that youth experience a greater likelihood of returning to court after each criminal referral they receive. It stands to reason that if a kid is severed from all his positive community influences, when he returns to that community and is uh, labeled or cast out or has difficulty reintegrating, um, that further exacerbates his criminogenic needs. And that's why we're going to see these increased recidivism numbers and things like that. Let's 
So um, I just mentioned the increased recidivism. Dr. Mark Lipsy conducted a meta-analysis meta and his results revealed that 63% of the young people who received community-based treatment as an alternative to incarceration were less likely to recidivate. This makes sense. Um, youth are, who go to incarceration are usually going to return to the community from which they came. We might as well teach them the life skills they need to uh, live a crime-free life in a in the community setting where they're going to have to practice those skills. And in Texas, another study showed that Texas researchers found young people um, were 14% likely to participate in illegal behavior than youth who have been incarcerated, less likely than youth who have been incarcerated. And before I turn it over to Judge Hockley, I would just like to say I, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. My name is David Redpath. I work at the Administrative Office of the Courts here in Arizona. I'm the Operations and Budget Manager and former Research Manager of the Juvenile Justice Services Division. Judge thank Hockley. you, David. Yeah, I think everybody was wondering who this guy was talking. So thank you for <laughs> introducing yourself. And now we're going to, and I appreciate all the information from Michelle and from I, David. Okay. Highlighting. <clears throat> I'm Peter Hockley. I'm Juvenile Court Judge. Uh, just by way of quick background, I've uh, been an attorney for 38 years. I was a defense attorney at juvenile court for eight years. I was a prosecutor for 12 years, and I've been on the bench for 10 years, eight of which have been assigned to juvenile court. Uh, I'm going to talk first about some of the examples from the bench. Uh, my real interest in terms of JDAI took uh, root when we started the process here in Pima County, and I was the head of the juvenile uh, division of the county attorneys office. We started looking at the brain development issues, um, looked at some studies in regards to how the brain isn't developing till really about age 25. And in some cases, if substance abuse is an issue with a juvenile, that it delays it even longer than that. Uh, our concerns really uh, surrounded around uh, having kids getting deeper into the system as a result of having contact uh, with our detention facility. Uh, we took a look at the uh, studies that showed us that even one night in detention increased the possibility of that juvenile uh, digging deeper into the juvenile justice system. And we didn't want to be having kids in detention uh, for a reason that, for example, we were mad at them about something or they made a mistake if they weren't uh, making mistakes that were creating uh, safety issues for our community. We were also concerned, and I think David touched on some of this, about exposing our lower risk youth to our higher risk youth. We know with peer pressure uh, that, that kids will want to try and set themselves apart from others, whether uh, they decide that they uh, want to get involved in crime, whether they want to prove that they're the big man on campus, or whatever it might be. So by exposing these lower risk youth to the higher risk youth, um, we were finding that those lower risk youth uh, were becoming more involved rather than the higher risk youth, youth becoming less, less involved. One of these days I'll be able to say youth. Um, and then we learned more about the criteria for detainment. We looked at our risk assessment instrument, the reasons why we had children getting into the system. Uh, getting detained um, and worked hard on revising that with a combination of folks, a collaboration of community folks, including both the county attorney's office and the public defender's office along with the court. We have to learn to trust that our intake officers are going to be able to utilize the risk assessment instruments uh, that they have, uh, that we've put together, and that at such point uh, when it, the numbers call for the juvenile not to be detained. If they still believe that the juvenile should be detained, that they uh, have a means to take that to a higher authority to make the decision whether to detain or not. We have to trust our intake officers so that when we do see juveniles at our detention hearings, that we can then dig a little bit deeper about what are the true safety issues and do they need to remain detained or can we look at some of the alternatives that we'll be talking about later during our presentations. 
Thank you, Judge Hockley. And now I think we have a few comments from Judge Rowland. Okay, I'm Randy Rowland uh, from Sydney, Nebraska, out in the uh, southern panhandle. Um, we found the best way to uh, keep kids out of detention is to move the detention facility 350 miles to the other side of the state. So uh, some of you may laugh, uh, but that's our reality that we're dealing with now. Uh, so obvious, uh, obviously some of the things we're dealing with is the distance to and from the facility. Uh, you know, it takes two deputies uh, in their vehicle out on the road with one juvenile. They're taking six hours uh, one way for the trip and then making the round trip right back home. Um, uh, for family visitations, uh, that really puts a crimp on that. Generally, if they're having visitations, it's going to be assisted uh, with payments from the state. Um, we have very few placement availabilities here in uh, western Nebraska and throughout rural Nebraska. We're always looking for more. Um, and with that, um, we try and come up with some local options. Um, we do have the shelter in Scotts Bluff uh, that we've been able to access on occasion. Um, family foster care, uh, some type of respite. Uh, generally, uh, I think it's real important, and we'll get into this a little later, when you're dealing with someone that's on probation, uh, having that safety plan in case something does blow up uh, where they have a place to go uh, maybe for 48 hours to cool off. Um, we have found that when someone is placed at detention, we're brainstorming the next day uh, and generally getting them out of detention within 24 to 48 hours, um, which makes you wonder why were they placed in detention to begin with. Generally, when it comes to me, um, they're already at detention, uh, and then we're trying to find some options to get them out of there. Um, we don't detain very often, thank goodness, uh, but those are some of the issues that we deal uh, within uh, greater Nebraska. So I think uh, there are some alternatives that Arizona is going to discuss, and I'll turn it back over to them. Thanks, Judge Rowland. Our next section, um, having finished the section, the danger of the detention, detention, which is if detention worked and if it wasn't harmful to kids, then we wouldn't be having that discussion. So now we move into the discussion of kids being different than adults. You know, in 1899, when they had the first juvenile court in, um, started, there was an acknowledgment that kids were different than adults. Well, that, that's no different today in 2018. And in fact, we actually have research to back up that premise that the kids are indeed not many adults, but different developmentally. So I'm going to turn it over to Angie, who's going to talk about adolescent development with a little help from Judge Hockley when we get to the, how the Supreme Court's weighed in on this issue. Thank you, Beth. And hello, everyone. My name is Angie Lopez. I work with David at the Arizona Supreme Court in the Juvenile Justice Service Division. And I am one of two JDAI state coordinators here in Arizona. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, as Beth alluded to, adolescent development and touch upon a couple of things that David and Judge Hockley have already mentioned. So what we know now based on the research, and I believe Judge Hockley mentioned this, is that the brain doesn't fully develop until the mid to late 20s, particularly the areas responsible for impulse control and judgment. So really what that means is that risky, um, poor decision making, that's a normal part of adolescence, which makes me feel better about my adolescence. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> but and what we also know is that exposure to trauma, exposure to violence, these things only exacerbate the situation. And unfortunately, many, if not the majority of the kids that come in contact with the juvenile justice system have experienced these things. Okay, <clears throat> so briefly the Supreme Court has come up with these decisions as you have uh, listed on the slide there. What they were talking about were uh, juveniles that were then prosecuted as adults receiving uh, lifetime sentences and recognizing the need uh, to look at the brain development the Supreme Court found that you could no longer sentence someone who was a juvenile at the time of the offense to life imprisonment. Uh, so as a result of that, there were a rash of resentencings for uh, adults that fell into that uh, area. Currently now we're going through the process, and in fact I have one of my own cases that's dealing with this issue, which are juveniles that were resentenced, but uh, based on their new sentence, 
for all practical purposes, they will be in prison for their entire life. And whether or not the Supreme Court uh, determined their rulings, whether or not that meant that um, they needed to be resentenced so they have an opportunity of parole, or if there's stacking of sentences, that if it turns out that they're going to be in for their natural life uh, in any regards, does that sentence stand? It's a real illustration of how the Supreme Court has recognized uh, the changes in juvenile behaviors and the development of the brain. So I'd ask you to keep that in mind as you're looking at working with our juvenile youth. Back to Angie. Thank you, Judge Hockley. Here's some good news. Um, longitudinal studies that began in the 50s really indicate that youth naturally grow out of this behavior, that they grow out of this risky, delinquent-type um, behavior, and they do this without any intervention at all. So I think this kind of confirms the notion that sometimes it's best for no intervention or little intervention from the system, especially when we're talking about low-risk youth. And what we know about confinement or detention environments, as David mentioned, is that this really interrupts natural adolescent development. It introduces young people to more high-risk peers. It removes them from their family, community, and education supports, and actually has a negative impact on recidivism, especially for those low-risk youth. So ultimately, despite our best efforts to train knowledgeable and caring staff and to improve the conditions inside of our juvenile detention facilities, the reality is that this environment is really um, not a great setting for our children. Ultimately, environment matters, and a negative environment will impact positive adolescent development. Thanks, Angie and Judge Hockley. So we've, we've, we've got that detention is harmful, and adolescents are different. So now we're going to hear from Judge Hockley and Sheila in Pima County about then what is the purpose of detention. Okay, I'm going to start first talking a little bit about the Pima County demographics. As you can see by the pie charts that we have here, that by race uh, we have a significant number of uh, white individuals, but that includes both our Hispanic and Latino population. So then we've broken it out by ethnicity, and you can see uh, the significant change there in terms of what the percentage is as it relates to uh, children of color. It's important to note that whenever we're running any of the variety of reports that we have, uh, that we break that out both by race, race and ethnicity in making uh, our decisions there. David's talked a little bit about uh, our procedures uh, with the juvenile court. Uh, when we're looking at detaining them as a judge, I need to make a couple of different findings. First, I do need to look at uh, probable cause pursuant to our Rule 23D. Uh, those were the different items that David had listed off uh, earlier that we have to consider. Also, if we are detaining, we need to look at whether or not uh, it's contrary to the welfare uh, of, the, of the juvenile to remain in the home, and we have a list of different um, findings that we need to make there that would include whether or not the juvenile is in need of services that can be provided only in an out-of-home setting, uh, whether or not the caretaker can actually control or supervise the juvenile, uh, whether the juvenile needs to be in an out-of-home placement for their protection, uh, whether or not there's a parent willing or capable of taking care of the child, and whether or not the juvenile requires stabilization or structure. It's important that we, if we're detaining the youth, that we have to make at least one of these findings in order to maintain some of the behavioral health services that the uh, respective juveniles um, will utilize. Sometimes uh, we, in terms of looking at things, that what we don't want to do is um, if we believe that, that they will be present um, and they're not a risk to the community, um, we need to, to go ahead and, and release them. We need to take closer look at exactly what the history of flight risk is, too, because sometimes a flight risk may be a parent not getting them to court, not that they keep running away, or that perhaps there's a reason for the runaway behavior, something that's going on at home, 
that maybe we need to be looking at getting our Child Protective Service or Department of Child Safety involved in the case. Uh, we should be open to any possibilities in terms of how we can release them. When we're looking at whether or not they would commit another offense injurious to themselves or others, exactly what does that mean? And we can't make assumptions that something is going to happen. We really should be looking at, um, it, it needs to be pretty solid. We really need to be looking at is it highly probable that that's going to happen. Uh, being held for another jurisdiction is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then whether or not uh, the minor or the public uh, really need the, that custodial protection. And we run into those situations such as with sex trafficking where sometimes we may feel that it's appropriate to go ahead and keep a juvenile detained in order to protect them. But I would caution you in doing that because there's, uh, no matter what, there's going to be some trauma by detaining a juvenile uh, that's in need of protection for themselves and we really need to be looking at what our other alternatives are that are available to us for purposes of that detention. And then in Arizona, we have some mandatory or discretionary transfer to adult processes that the county attorney has, and sometimes we may need to detain them because we're going to be seeing something filed in the, um, in the adult court. Um, one of the things that irritates me sometimes is when we're in court and we have a defense attorney there arguing for a juvenile whether they should be released or not, and they always have a defense attorney there to represent them. Uh, if a parent doesn't show up, they throw their hands up and say, well, I don't have any options, when in fact there are uh, options uh, that we should be looking at. If a parent's not able to be there, maybe they can pick a juvenile up later in the day. Uh, maybe there's a guardian that they can be released to or we need to be looking at DCS being there. We need to emphasize that whether they ha it's a parent, guardian, or the Department of Child Safety that's comparable to Child Protective Services, that they do need to be attending these court hearings. And if they can't attend in person, we need to make accommodations so they can at least appear telephonically. We need to make sure that there's a safe place for them to be released to, and sometimes that's not necessarily home. We need to make sure we take into account uh, the victim uh, in the case, as well as whether or not the juvenile that's before us is a victim, which may in some cases be uh, the situation when you're looking at domestic violence. Uh, we shouldn't be considering uh, just because uh, a kid is maybe a little disrespectful to us while they're in court or rolling their eyes at us or something, that's really not a ground, and we're really not teaching them anything by virtue of that. We certainly can say something to them but is that really a safety issue uh, for the public or for the particular juvenile themselves? And then we have to remember that if there are no charges pending, that we need to expedite getting them out, even if there's holds from other jurisdiction and helping to establish some guidelines as to how soon they need to exercise those particular holds. We shouldn't be holding juveniles for weeks at a time, waiting for some other county, some other state, or some other jurisdiction to come and pick them up. And then finally, we need to remember uh, the trauma that the kids suffer when they're, they're in detention. No matter how great someone's detention facility is, juveniles are still suffering trauma as a result of that detainment. And we need to really weigh that against the risk to the community and the alternatives that we have available to us. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Sheila Kemble. I'm the JDAI coordinator here in Pima County. And I want to share with you some of our alternatives that we found um, to be successful and share some of the successes, but also sometimes some of the struggles that we've seen with that. Um, we implemented uh, solely GPS monitoring uh, about three years ago. Um, and replaced our old radio frequency monitoring that really um, was just a device that told us when youth came and went from their home. When we switched over to the GPS monitoring, um, a couple of things happened that I think were beneficial to the court and the youth. One is um, cost effective. It saved us some money um, to go to the GPS monitoring. In addition, what we found is that we had a lot of youth that were unable 
um, to be released from detention on our old monitoring because they didn't have a landline. Um, some families weren't able to get a landline. Either they didn't have the funds for it, um, maybe they'd had a landline previously, and then uh, weren't able to pay off an outstanding balance so they couldn't get the landline reinstated. And so what we found is that we were able to release more youth from detention um, using the GPS monitoring because of that. Um, what we also noticed is that um, oftentimes it was our youth um, of color that were unable to secure a landline. And so that was impacting them being released and ultimately um, having a negative impact on disproportionate minority contact. Um, so we have um, also seen the probation officers more comfortable with having youth released from detention on the GPS than they were on the other type of monitoring. And so therefore, they're willing to, to be in favor of them being released um, out of detention with this enhanced monitoring. Uh, we also have um, had two evening reporting centers um, and found some successes and some struggles with those um, along the way. And what we find most important is that we learn from the areas that we've struggled a little bit with and then try and enhance it down the road. The successes that we've noticed is that it does provide additional supervision for youth after school. Um, our evening reporting centers have gone from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, our staff picks them up. Um, at school or at home, and then takes them to the program and then returns them back home at the end of the evening. Um, we provide uh, some educational support, some recreational support, and also feed them while we have them there um, for the evening. Um, I think one of the biggest successes that we've seen from our evening reporting center is the ability to connect uh, youth with their community. And so we really work to try and bring in community partners whether that's for the whole evening of the program or whether they come in for an hour or a piece of the time, um, but really making sure that the kids are connected with their community because we know that they're not going to be court involved forever and we know that when they finish probation um, that they need to maintain those positive structures within the community um, to be able to connect with outside of the court. Um, some downsides of that that we've noticed have been um, making sure youth attend the program. And our programs have typically gone four to five nights per week, per, during the week, um, not on weekends. And uh, we constantly are evaluating that to determine what's going to be best to ensure that the kids are successful. Recently in our evening reporting center, we um, bumped it back to four nights a week um, to try and, and make it more successful for the kids so it's not five nights and, and they're having attendance challenges. We also have partnered up with a community agency, so our evening reporting center is held at their facility. That, that provides them with that additional structure um, and connection into the community with them so even when they're finished with our program, they're able to stay uh, engaged with the community partner. Um, we really work hard when we try and identify these community partners to make sure that their mission and vision is consistent with what the juvenile court's mission and vision is. We want to make sure that when we're placing youth in their facilities um, that they're also engaged in um, positive youth development, um, ensuring that they um, help them build their strengths, um, and also work on mapping out what they need to be successful. Um, and that's something that we've been able to do through our community partners. Um, our last alternative um, to detention is uh, our ACES DVAC um, center. So several years ago, we implemented what was called our Domestic Violence Alternative Center. And that was to address the multiple violations that we were seeing, um, actually our highest referral population, which was of domestic violence misdemeanor offenses. So we developed DVAC, which allowed law enforcement to divert youth um, to DVAC instead of taking them to our intake um, and ultimately the youth being detained. Um, oftentimes what we were seeing is that for these domestic violence offenses, the youth would be brought to detention and then they would stay at least the one night, but oftentimes more than just that one night. Um, in order to get appropriate services in place. And what we found is that that wasn't really effective and what we needed to do was to really uh, 
get these kids back into their home with appropriate services because um, putting them in detention wasn't allowing anybody an opportunity to work on really what the underlying issues are with the youth and family. Um, a couple of years ago, what we did is we reinvented DVAC and expanded it um, to the ACES Center, which is the Alternative Community Engagement Services Center. And what we've done is, is shifted over all the functions that were at DVAC We've opened up um, ACEs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we've also expanded it out a little bit um, so that status offenses, which are things like um, runaway, truancy, curfew violations, that any youth that would be uh, come into contact with law enforcement and they don't have an adult there to release them to, that they would also come to ACEs. And a probation officer would talk to them about the offense contact parent or guardian and identify what services and resources in the community they could be connected to. Another feature of ACES that we're really excited about is allowing officers to be able to bring youth to ACES instead of arresting them for something solely because they don't have someone to release the youth to. So for example, if law enforcement comes in contact with the youth in the community and they can't get a hold of a parent or guardian, and maybe something was happening, uh, like a disorderly conduct, but really there was no, the officer wouldn't arrest them for that had they had an a, um, adult parent guardian to release them to. But because of that, they had to. Um, they could bring them to ACEs as an alternative. And then uh, the staff at ACEs, which is probation officers, would be able to make that connection with the uh, family or Department of Child Safety if needed. What we're finding is that this is, is serving to be a resource for the officers, but also for families who are in need of services and don't know where to reach out to. So in addition to providing that um, alternative to detention for the domestic violence kids, we also are, are um, serving as a resource for the families and law enforcement. Thank you, Sheila and Judge Hockley. And now I think we're going to go back to Nebraska. And Judge Hawk, or Judge Rowland is going to talk about custody, some alternatives. Sure, similar and to uh, Arizona, Nebraska has uh, Section 43248, which lists out when detention can be used. Uh, as the slide shows, there's several reasons. Uh, the juvenile has to be 11 years or older first. Uh, there has to be an immediate uh, removal that is necessary for the juvenile's protection. Uh, could be reasons of mental illness and dangerous. Uh, risk of harm before the court hearing. Uh, one common one that we see is a uh, reasonable ground uh, to believe the juvenile is run away, um, reasonable cause to believe the juvenile is in violation of probation, uh, and the juvenile is a flight risk or a danger to life or property. That's another common one that we will see out here on occasion. Uh, truancy, which I've yet to detain anybody for truancy. Uh, and reasonable grounds to believe the juvenile is immune from prosecution uh, for prostitution under the Nebraska Trafficking Act. So um, I think we've all seen some of those instances, uh, or at least a few of them. So that takes us to what do we do to avoid detaining? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a shelter placement, uh, finding other members in the community, family members, um, is a place that's being used for respite foster care, that may be available. Um, electronic monitoring is a huge one uh, that we use. Um, in one of my counties, I actually have the sheriff that makes his EM uh, service available, uh, and then we'll switch out with probation service provider if we need it, but that helps us save some time. Um, we do have CAM bracelets, although uh, uh, we have to have a provider come down generally from Scotts Bluff to put that on. Uh, we do have access to those. Uh, probation has just recently uh, started allowing us to use drug patches, so you're not playing the catch-me-if-you-can game with the kid that's uh, using dope. Um, tracker services, in addition, so you have a person getting eyes on the kid rather than just the electronic monitoring when they're out and about. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the team planning for solutions, uh, when you have someone on probation, have that safety plan in place uh, in case things do blow up uh, where we have a place uh, to put the child. Um, so 
Some other things we can use uh, in the court system uh, is increase the frequency of hearings. If you need to micromanage a case, so to speak, I've had cases where we've come back on a weekly basis just to make things, sure that things are going well. We don't do that very often, but rather than just saying, okay, we're going to see you every three months, uh, we're going to increase the time that we have them uh, to make sure that the services that are needed are being provided. Um, we, I use technology a lot out here, uh, especially when you're talking a kid being placed at a detention center 350 miles away in Lancaster County or Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, most of my counties have a contract with them, so that's where they go. Um, they do have WebEx uh, and Jabber available. Um, we use both those. Um, if we have someone placed in detention, we are having court the next business day or the next court day. Um, if attorneys aren't available to appear in person, we'll let them appear by telephone. They can use Jabber as well. Um, but the whole purpose is to get things going and get a plan started on how to get the kid out of detention, if we can. And generally, there is a way to do that. Um, sometimes there are some technical issues with using Jabber. Still doesn't stop a telephone. They still have a telephone, so we can make that work. Um, I, I think... Uh, Training with the on-call probation officers is huge. Um, I had one young lady uh, at the end of last year that was on probation. Um, she was doing well. She lives with her grandparents, who are also her adopted parents because of abuse from her uh, mother uh, several years ago. Um, she got upset. She pushed her grandfather. Uh, she got a little mouthy with the officer when he came and pushed him. And the next thing she knew, she was loaded up with two deputies in the middle of the night and on her way to the Lancaster County Detention Center. Um, we had a hearing the next day. We were able to basically turn the deputies around right after they arrived from uh, their 10-hour trip uh, and put them back on the road for another 10 hours, unfortunately, uh, but got services in place locally, and it's worked out very well since then. Um, and part of that is that on-call probation officer really needs to contact the supervising probation officer. I don't believe that happened in that case, and if it would have, I think we would have been able to come up with a plan to avoid uh, the trip to the detention center. Uh, for those Nebraska judges, I will also tell you I was at a meeting last week in Lincoln. Uh, the director of the Lancaster County Detention Center was there, along with uh, the Douglas County Detention Center director from Omaha. They have seen a huge spike in assaults, uh, not only on staff, but on juveniles in their facilities over the last year. Um, and the way I put it is, I'm not going to send my sheep into the wolf's den because my kids generally aren't going to survive down there for very long. And the one lady on probation was already talking suicide uh, by the time we got her onto a jabber hearing to get her out of there. So that probation safety planning is a huge piece. Um, I have in Sydney, Nebraska, where I'm based out of, a high school uh, principal comes to every juvenile case uh, for the most part uh, when he sees his kids on the calendar. And we uh, fax or email uh, him the calendar every Friday for the next week so he knows uh, who was scheduled to appear. Uh, and that's provided us some great insight for the educational piece as well uh, when dealing with those. And it's not just for a kid in detention. He does that for any of his students. Um, and then again, we have our Through the Eyes of the Child teams uh, here locally, and that's another great resource to address uh, some of the issues that we're seeing on a local level. Um, again, the cost, I would just reiterate, uh, not only to place the kids in detention, but it takes time from uh, the sheriff's office to transport, the cost of doing that. You've got officers out of the county then. Um, it just all adds up. Um, and one of the things that we do, I'm lucky, generally the bars that I work with, both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, are very open to collaboration, especially when it comes to detention and finding those local resources. We have one local service provider in Sydney that started uh, a day reporting center and even an re evening reporting center, and that has assisted us also, especially in the summer months. Uh, when school's not in session, to have a place for the, the kids to go and uh, 
have some supervision there. So with that, I think we're on to the next area. Well, thank you, Judge, and it sounds like there's a lot of good things happening in Arizona and Nebraska. We're going to continue what Judge Rowland had started to talk about, which is the cost of detention, and not just from a financial point of view, but Monica and Michelle will keep it in Nebraska, and they'll lead us through this section. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica Miles Steffens. I am one of the directors of placement with the juvenile division within the Administrative Office of Probation here in Nebraska. Um, and along with Michelle, we co-coordinate our statewide JDAI efforts. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be on the, the presentation today. We've talked a lot about the cost of detention. Um, Today, so I'm just going to briefly touch on a few things as we've seen working with our districts and working with the young people across the state. We've talked a lot about um, they fall behind in their education. Each detention center uses a different mode um, to be able to provide education. It could be online, it could be with teachers, but there's always a lag time in getting youth their schoolwork from their local schools um, and that kind of thing. So not only while they're in detention, but once they transition back to their community or to the next place that they're going, um, that education continues to fall farther and farther behind. They lose connections with positive peers. Um, we've heard time and time again from young people who have said, well, I did this with this person that I met in detention. Um, and so we are um, placing them in an opportunity to learn things in detention, but not the types of things I think we traditionally think they learn in terms of um, not wanting to be there again. Youth definitely lose connections with their families, um, regardless of whether they are 350 miles away or they're only five miles away. Um, oftentimes our youth come from families that are experiencing poverty, um, families who work multiple shifts, have young, other younger siblings at home who don't have childcare. And so um, we even see this in Lincoln and Omaha where youth um, don't get visits from their families um, because of those other socioeconomic factors, and so they continue to be isolated. Detention centers also have a lot of structure, and so there are limited times for visitations, and those aren't always flexible to meet families' needs as it relates to even phone calls or visitations. And so that cost of families and the communities um, and the young people are definitely for sure. I'm going to let Michelle talk a little bit about the actual fiscal cost of detention. Sure, thank you, Monica. So not only do we have the impact that detention has on families and the young people, the trauma that's endured, you look at the financial cost. So for those of our um, judges that are out on the webinar here from Western Nebraska, we have a significant um, financial cost to our law enforcement agencies that have to transport the young people um, across the state due to how our um, detention facilities are aligned here in Nebraska. So when we take those law enforcement officers um, off the streets, they're not able to provide for the community safety, which we would like them to do, because they're having to transport young people across the state. You have the financial um, impact of the housing of the juvenile or the young person itself at the detention center. and any other additional transportation that may be needed to go back and forth to here, back and forth to those court hearings. And so like Judge Roland had mentioned, he uses a lot of video, jabber, you know, web-based technology to try to help offset some of those costs. But those are things for consideration as we continue um, our work in this area. So when I look at this next slide for everyone, um, this is a little cost comparison for this is here in Nebraska. And the data that we were able to break down is we looked at um, a young person from our Judicial District 12 area. So this may be um, not quite as significant for those judges that are maybe a little bit closer to the different detention centers in Nebraska. But depending on the facility here in Nebraska, the price ranges um, from $1,400 to $1,992 for seven days in a detention center. The transportation cost one way, round trip, is $1,200. And then taking into consideration possible law enforcement salaries, this doesn't include any overtime, but if we're paying them just for the transportation to and from their hours that they're um, driving in the car, 
That's approximately $300, which gives us a total of $2,900 to $3,222, again, depending on the facility because of the different rates that are in place. The alternative that Judge Rowland spoke about um, in a couple of his slides previously, in Nebraska, we have some tracker services that are available, the electronic monitoring and shelter care. And you can see on the slide there, the total cost to utilize those services is substantially less of $1,625, again, for seven days if we were able to put that young person on an alternative to detention versus sending them to a secure facility across the state. And then I think Judge Rowland was going to give a little bit of insight to his area as well in this Sure, just kind of hit on what they said about the financial costs and also uh, beyond that. Um, there's the interruption to the schooling. We found that to be a huge issue. Um, also with the mental health services, for the most part, uh, we've been advised when they're down there, they're not getting those mental health services. Um, if they were on probation, they probably established a good relationship with a local counselor who's working with them. Um, that gets disrupted. Uh, family and friends, uh, I mean, we're talking you're 350 miles away, you're just not going to have people there uh, to be seen. Um, you know, on, on occasions when we've had kids there uh, for uh, a few days, uh, I offer the parents uh, and family the ability to use our Jabber system uh, so they can have face-to-face, -face, similar to FaceTime. Um, Shelly, who runs the Lancaster County Detention Center, is fantastic. Um, the one young lady that we had down there uh, was discussing suicide. Um, so we had Shelly come into the room uh, and had a talk with her to help calm her down, uh, get things uh, back on track as best we could with what was going on there. Um, but uh, the mental scarring uh, that can take place is just huge. So it's not just financial. Uh, there are a lot of other things to be thinking about with that as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess the next screen kind of talks a little bit more about that. While in detention, uh, the juveniles do not receive forms of treatment or services that are, are probably necessary and have been ongoing on many occasions before they were placed there. Uh, the money that we've talked about also spent on detention uh, can be repurposed into community-based options uh, and add a savings uh, to the counties. Uh, one thing we have to remember, everything pre-adjudication in Nebraska goes back to the county to pay, uh, and that's a big issue. Um, we do have community-based interventions that uh, we can make available. Uh, that helps with behavioral change, benefits the youth, their family, and our communities. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we aren't going to have time for questions. There's just a couple minutes left, and I think we have a commitment to end on time. So I want to I, I want to bring to everybody's attention and remind everybody about the second session in this continuing discussion about detention and the purposes of detention is um, on March 13th at 12:30 to 1:30 Central Time. Um, I, there's resources that are at least on my screen. Um, I, I don't know that everybody can see those, but they will be, everything will be listed in the Court Improvement Project page, in Air, if I have that right, in, in Nebraska, uh, as well as a recording of this webinar, which I think will also be shared then with um, Arizona. I don't know if Beth, Monica, is, you have some uh, closing remark there? Yes, thanks, Beth. If the people do have questions, any of the judges that are on have questions, I would encourage them to either email um, one of our court improvement um, staff or myself or Michelle, and we would be happy to make sure that we address those questions in session two. I hope that you'll join us for session two so we can talk further about some of the good things that are happening, some of the successful alternatives, and some of the things that we're working on um, both in Arizona and in Nebraska to create different alternatives um, for youth in our communities. So thank you for joining us today. And I'll just ask Arizona if they had any closing comment to Sheila or Angie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Nebraska and Beth, for helping us with this. We've enjoyed working with you all. And we look forward to session two.
Thank, Thank you. you.